Okay, so we are going to get started. Yat A, hello. She Rachel Kilgore Yanishya. Kiani Nishle. Biligana Besha Chin. Debeth Lejana Dasha Che. Biligana Dasha Nala. Ekot Ego Dene Atsan Nishle. I am called Rachel Kilgore. I am Towering House Born for the White People Clan. My maternal grandfather is Black Sheep Clan. My paternal grandfather is White People Clan. So in this way, I am a Navajo woman. I am a doctoral student in the Combined Clinical and Counseling Psychology Program at Utah State University. And I am pleased to welcome everyone to the Mentoring and Encouraging Student Academic Success or MESA's program second annual Indigenous Knowledge Symposium. We are happy everyone has taken the time to be here with us today to listen to our speakers and the knowledge they have to share with us. The Indigenous Knowledge Symposium is an annual event put on by the MESA's program here at Utah State University with support from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The goal of the symposium is to increase our collective understanding of the importance of Indigenous knowledge across the sciences and the pivotal role Indigenous scholars and the communities hold for the future development of new knowledge. This year, our, uh, excuse me, this year, our theme is making connections between indigenous cultural teachings and the scientific worlds. Today, we will hear from three scholars, Dr. Keisha Supernot, Dr. Tommy Rock, and Dr. Henry Fowler. Each presenter will talk for about 35 minutes. Following their presentation, the audience will have 10 minutes for questions, which you can submit via the Q&A feature on Zoom. Also, all presentations will be recorded and available online after today's event. I would like, I would like to now welcome Dr. Janice Bettinger, Vice Provost and Director for the Global Engagement at Utah State University to provide us with the Utah, U, Utah State University land acknowledgement. Doctor. Thank you, Rachel. As a land grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah who have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. These tribes are the Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Indians, Navajo Nation, Ute Indian Tribe, Northwestern Band of Shoshone, Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, San Juan Southern Paiute, Skull Valley Band of Goshute, and the White Mesa Band of the Ute Mountain Ute. We acknowledge these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as people who have cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance history, experiences and resiliency of the native people who are still here today. Thank you, Dr. Bettinger. I will now turn the time over to Jennifer Yazi to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you everyone for attending and we hope you enjoy. Thank you, Rachel. My name is Jennifer Yazi. Um, I would like to introduce myself in Navajo. So Yate Shae Jennifer Yazi and Shek. Kian and Shwa Kashtu Bashishin Ashiki Dashate Kortu Dashimala. Um, good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Yazi. I am of the Towering House clan, born for the Red Bottom People clan. My maternal grandfather is of the Salt People clan, and my paternal grandfather's clan is of the Big Water clan. So today I will be providing the transition, transitions between our speakers, as well as facilitating the Q&A for today's event. As a reminder, the presenters will speak for 35 minutes and we will reserve 10 minutes for questions after. Please use the feature to enter your questions after the presenter has finished. So today, our first speaker is Dr. Keisha Supernot. Dr. Keisha Supernot is Director of the Institute of Perry and Indigenous Archaeology and an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on indigenous archaeology, archaeological remote sensing, and heart-centered archaeological practice. She is the founding director of the Exploring Metis Identity Through Archaeology, 
It is abbreviated E-M-I-T-A project where she works with her own relatives to explore the Metis archaeological record. Dr. Supernaut, I will now turn the time over to you. Hi, hey, thank you for that introduction. Tanse, Hawasa Kipi Yuita Hatnia, um Zikatsan, a Miskuti was guy on no Jinia, a Machifnia. Um hello everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today. So I introduce myself in one of my ancestral languages. I'm AT, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about who we are uh, in a moment. Uh, my uh, gifted Indigenous name is She Brings the Children Home. And I am currently located in Amiskuchi Wiskaigan, which is the Cree name for Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This is my homeland. It's a place where my families have, have lived and loved and uh, spent time for a long time. Uh, Edmonton has also long been a gathering place of a diverse set of Indigenous nations and remains that today. It's the land of Treaty 6 and the Métis homeland as well. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about how I engage Indigenous knowledge and cultural teachings into my archaeological practice and how I bring it into some of the scientific methods that I use as I study the past uh, with Indigenous peoples and, and build these collaborative kinds of projects. I, one of the things that I'm really interested in is not just the cultural teachings, which I think are extremely important, but the ways in which knowledge itself is generated. And when I'm working in my own context with my own knowledge holders and elders and learning about our ways, one of the things that really interests me is how I can understand my family's past and our ancestors from our own perspectives and using our own knowledge systems. So I want to start a little bit before I get into some examples of, of how I engage this with my work. I want to start a little bit by talking about knowledge systems. So Indigenous knowledge is something that we're hearing a lot more about in terms of how we bring it into various fields and disciplines and the opportunities and challenges that that might bring. But fundamentally, this is about how knowledge itself comes to be, right? So knowledge systems are ways of understanding and making sense of the world. The world. A term that we often hear in academia is epistemology, which draws out of sort of Western philosophy. Epistemology being an understanding of how knowledge is actually itself generated, what constitutes knowledge, where its boundaries are, who holds knowledge, um, what counts as sort of valid knowledge. There are many knowledge systems throughout the world. There's different ways to generate understandings of the world around us and different ways to understand who gets to hold and pass on that knowledge. And the one that is you know, most common in a lot of scientific disciplines, of course, is science. But science itself is a knowledge system. It is a way of making sense of the world. It is a way of observing the world around, relying a lot on the senses, things that are measurable, things that are observable, and then generating and testing hypotheses based on that information that is observed. So this is really, uh, it's important to understand that science itself is a knowledge system. And there are others that also make sense of the world. The world. And Indigenous peoples have their own knowledge systems that are connected to Indigenous lands. There are some similarities at times between how Indigenous communities make sense of the world and how science makes sense of the world, observation, experimentation, etc. But there's also some really important differences in the ways that Indigenous knowledge actually operates and actually makes sense of the world around. So coming back to this question of science, I want to lay out a little bit of what we know about Western knowledge systems and how knowledge is generated within them. What are some of the core sort of concepts that uh, are relied upon within these Western knowledge systems? And then I'm going to contrast that a little bit with broad, some broad thematic things about Indigenous knowledge systems and also talk about why it's really important to think about the fact that there are multiple Indigenous ways of knowing. There's not only one and that it's very much connected to particular histories. So what are some of the characteristics of Western knowledge systems? Well, empiricism, this is the idea of observation, that knowledge comes through experiencing with the senses. If you can see it, touch it, hear it, it is therefore real. It's also derived from the theory that reason is the source of knowledge, that knowledge primarily comes from the mind and from this ability to, to reason. I think, therefore, I am. 
And this is very much tied up with ways of making sense of the world within a Western knowledge system. Skepticism is also a key component. Evaluation, consideration, examination, reflecting on uh, the, the results, you know, this idea that we need to have certain types of data to understand something to be true, uh, and that needs to be proven uh, as well. One of the challenges that I think we face in engaging Indigenous knowledge systems in, with Western knowledge systems is there still tends to be an understanding or belief that the best way to know the world is through science and that this is the method to get to truth, right? So that science is the pathway to, to truth and that the categories of things recognized within science are real and all other categories are less real. And I think this is something that we, it, it, again, presents a challenge to the ways in which Indigenous knowledge also has validity, also has a, a way of knowing that has um, truth in it as well. And that the only way to know the world is not science. There are many ways to know the world. Another key component, and this is, I'm going to come back to this because this is really important in my own discipline, is the way in which Western knowledge systems break things apart. Think about taxonomies, right? We think about, you know, trees, uh, evolutionary systems, you know, the way we organize the animal kingdom in a Western knowledge system is all about sort of branching and dividing, putting things into boxes. In my own field in archaeology, we're all about putting things into categories based on observable traits the type of material that things are made of, the type of function that they play. These become important categories that we then use to form knowledge. One of the big challenges as well to bringing Indigenous knowledge into science is the fact that these Western systems of knowledge have often done a lot of harm to Indigenous peoples and communities. Uh, and this is in part because these knowledge systems have been positioned as superior, as the right way, to, to understand the world and that everyone should learn this knowledge system and people will be better off if they understood it. However, a lot of the knowledge that we see today is actually knowledge that's been extracted from Indigenous peoples and lands. And again, speaking from my own discipline, this is very, very clear. Archaeology in North, the lands we call North America has primarily been on Indigenous histories without Indigenous peoples engagement. So, Archaeologists have literally taken the bones of Indigenous ancestors out of the ground and put them into institutions for scientific study without permission. This has done harm to Indigenous peoples and continues in many ways to do harm to Indigenous peoples. Information and knowledge generated through a Western knowledge system has then sometimes been used to misrepresent Indigenous peoples. Um, we think about this and again the relationship with anthropology more broadly with sort of race science, this idea that you can analyze the bones of someone and, and come up with characteristics of particular biological races, which we now know do not actually exist. So information that's being generated through these knowledge systems is itself uh, has been done, been doing harm. And then our, our knowledge as Indigenous peoples has often been extracted and institutionalized, placed into academic institutions, to museums, databases, etc. And really we're at a point now where dialogue is happening to shift this. And I think that's really, really exciting. But we need to understand the history of this as well and why this has become so important. Um, so a couple of things to think about as limitations to what Western frameworks can bring to an understanding of the world. So because the way that these Western systems of knowledge work, everything broken down in its constituent parts sometimes makes the interconnectedness of those things less understandable. So breaking out things into smaller and smaller pieces doesn't necessarily allow for the, the view of the whole and how things interconnect. Separating things out based on these observable kinds of traits assumes that there's meaning in those traits, right? So again, coming back to my discipline, this uh, artifact is made out of a particular material, it therefore must be most like this other artifact made of the same material, when in the knowledge system of the people who made it, there may be some very different way to understand their, those relations. It also assumes that the material that is studied or the data that is studied is an object to be evaluated. Again, with my own discipline, 
that artifact made out of a particular material becomes something that is then weighed and measured and photographed and cataloged. It is an object of study. And therefore, there's certain things that have to be done to care for that object in order to ensure it's protected. Uh, and so this is a very common sort of sequence of things. So pull, it, pull things out of the ground, place them into these categories, and then eventually they end up in a box in a museum somewhere, not unlike the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. The question becomes, is that actually what we want to learn about in the past? Is that actually telling the human story of these lands? Is this actually connected to the indigenous knowledge system in which those materials were, were generated? So indigenous knowledge systems, again, I want to point out, these are general uh, similarities between a lot of indigenous knowledge systems, but as I'll talk about in a moment, it is really important to also be attentive to the specific and situated nature of knowledge systems. So I will be talking today about Métis archaeology, Métis ways of knowing. The concepts and ideas that I bring into this may have connections and threads with other indigenous ways of knowing, but can't be picked up and taken wholesale to other contexts because they're related to particular peoples, histories, lands, etc. But some things we can say, in general, Indigenous knowledge systems tend to emphasize connection and relation, not separation and objectification. So as opposed to the breaking apart of things, Indigenous knowledge systems tend to emphasize the interconnectedness of things. So how things are connected, how they're engaged, where they're situated, so the lands and histories in which they are located, how these different, even, even the concept of being and what it means to be and to be animate and to be alive is often very much about connection and relation and doesn't have the same kind of hard boundaries uh, as many Western knowledge systems do. It's also part of our lived in everyday experience. It's not something that can just be abstracted. It's something that actually informs all the parts of, of what we do. And it's in, embedded into all of that uh, as well. So that's sort of the foundation for what I want to now spend a little bit of time talking about, which is my work as an archaeologist, as an Indigenous archaeologist, um, talking about how this relates to my own family and my own ways of knowing, uh, and how the both the Western knowledge systems of science can bring a lot to this practice, but so can uh, the concepts that engage with my own um, ways of knowing as an Indigenous person, as a Métis person specifically. Over the past 20 years, 25 years almost now, we've seen an increasing emphasis on Indigenous archaeologies. Again, archaeology is a very clear discipline where we've had a lot of history of extraction, of bad relations, of taking of ancestors, and putting Indigenous ancestors and belongings into museums. So there's a lot of uh, accounting that needs to happen within the discipline. So Indigenous archaeologies, therefore, invite archaeology with, for, and by Indigenous peoples, bringing in Indigenous knowledge into archaeological practice, finding ways to integrate these things together, approaching the archaeological record from an Indigenous perspective, especially those of us who are Indigenous archaeologists. There's also a growing work to empower Indigenous communities to seek redress and restorative justice for past harms. I've been very actively working on supporting Indigenous communities in Canada, try to find the unmarked graves of children who were taken to Indian residential schools and who never came home uh, and are likely buried in, in unmarked graves around that. I use archaeological methods to do this, and therefore these types of project really, projects really emerge from Indigenous archaeologies. And this can also really lead us down some innovative applications of scientific methods. For me, some of the most exciting science in archaeology right now is emerging from partnerships where Indigenous peoples are asking questions that archaeologists never thought to ask. And it then challenges those non-Indigenous archaeologists to find methods to try to address that question using the scientific method. So the things I've talked about already are a little bit more abstract. What I want to do now is show you how this actually works in, in pr my own practice. As introduced, I run the Imita project, Exploring Métis Identity Through Our Archaeology, really trying to bring the strengths of archaeological practice together with our, our ways of knowing as Métis people to enrich our understanding of our past lives. And for me, this is deeply, deeply personal. So this is about 
interesting archaeology, absolutely, but this is also about the history of my family. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the Métis in a moment, but I need to start here. And I appreciated uh, my, my two Navajo colleagues who were grounding themselves in their lineage, where they come from, to whom they belong. And this is so important for us to do as Indigenous people. So these are my great-great-grandparents. This is the photo you have here. Alexis Supernant, born in Alberta in about 1870, and Marie Flora Gaucher, also born in Alberta around 1883. And the time periods in which I work, which is primarily in the second half of the 19th century, is connected to the times in which they were born. And so I get to learn about aspects of their life by doing the work that, that I do, because a lot of those stories have not always been passed on. Um, my father was in foster care growing up, and so we didn't have that same kind of connection. The work that I do with them and with their history really brings me home in important ways. And the other, uh, the document you have here is something called Métis script, which I'll really briefly touch on in a moment. It was a tool of our dispossession, but also it captured parts of our um, kinship systems and our connection to place that can be really valuable. So this is my three times great grandmother, Louise uh, Gladue was her, her maiden name, and she was Papa's Chase Cree from here in Edmonton. So there was supposed to be a reserve for us here in the city, and she through a whole series of events, uh, that some of which were very shady, um, we lost our reserve and she took this Métis script in order to be able to feed her family. So the, this is where I start from. This is the place that I wanna tell the stories of my ancestors. So who are the Métis? Well, the term itself is from the French, Métissage and Métis, and it does mean uh, at its heart mixed or a mixture. And uh, there's a lot of terms that kind of get thrown around. At, but what I want to really emphasize here is that Métis people are a post-contact Indigenous people. We are recognized Indigenous people in Canada. So we're one of three what's called in the Constitution Aboriginal people. So there's First Nations, there's Métis, and there's Inuit. And we do have a history of um, emerging from marriages country marriages between European fur traders, both French and Scottish English, and Indigenous women from different nations. What happened is in the early days of the fur trade, there were a lot of these unions, and the children of those unions formed collective communities. So if I look at my own family, you know, four or five generations back is when the children of a lot of those marriages were uh, inter intermarrying, connecting, living particular life ways. And so while our history is originally of mixedness, we form distinct communities and with culture and a language and an archaeological record that I get to study. There's been a lot of conversation about Métis and we have people in Canada who claim to be Métis because they have a single Indigenous ancestor from, you know, 1700, sort of the Elizabeth Warren effect, uh, but the Canadian version. And for me, on my dad's side, which is the side uh, that I'm related to, to Métis folks, you have to go back six generations to find a non-Indigenous person. So there's this generations and generations of intermarriage, and that's what makes me Métis, that I have Métis ancestors, not that I have a single Indigenous ancestor. So we are also a nation. We are an Indigenous nation, and this really did emerge out of the dynamics of the fur trade, uh, the social and economic and political dynamics. We played a really important role in helping to move goods and people and things across the lands we now call Canada, building fur trade posts, connecting with local Indigenous communities um, that we may have had relations with. This is a really important part of our history, but also part of our history is we had a collective sense of identity pretty early on. So by 1816, you have Cuthbert Grant, uh, a Métis man, uh, after a a conflict, a skirmish between British and Métis forces, raising the flag and declaring the new nation in the, in the West. And this became a really important moment. When the Dominion of Canada was established in 1867, they were seeking to assert sovereignty over our homeland. And so we resisted. And there were two resistances, one in 1869 and one in 1885. Uh, the first one resulted in the establishment of the province of Manitoba. The second one um, 
resulted in the hanging of one of our major leaders, Louis Riel, who's the man with the, the mustache in the center of that picture that you see. And after those two resistances to Canadian dominion, oh, there was a whole set of ways in which we were dispossessed. And that has sort of put us to the margins in, a, in, in sometimes very literal ways, without having a land base, without having a kind of a, a support of our, our way of life. Different story than our First Nations cousins uh, in terms of the ways in which we are dispossessed and, and constrained. I came to practice Métis archaeology in, you know, about 10 years ago now, and this really was something that I wanted to use to explore different perspectives on Métis history, bringing in Métis daily life to the material record, um, bringing in the stories that don't make it into the history. Uh, so there's a lot of, sort of written history and there's a lot of uh, historical documents that talk about talk about us, but not written by us and not really getting at our way of life. And one of the things that the science of archaeology can do is illuminate some of those patterns of daily life uh, at certain time periods. And we can demonstrate where we were and what our homeland was. The homeland really, there's some core nodes, but it's the majority of kind of Western Canada, east of the Rockies to kind of the, you know, Western side of the Great Lakes. So very, very large area, including some areas in the US. Uh, so Montana and Dakotas definitely has still have Métis people there today, even though they're not recognized as Métis in the United States. So I really wanted to bring in our stories and particularly stories of women and children and families. A lot of the historical documents we do have really are written by Catholic priests. Many of our, our ancestors were Catholic people in the fur trade, you know, writing notes about what they were doing, explorers and adventurers coming out. And then later on, non-Métis historians who are drawing from a lot of those documents, they don't capture the fullness of our history. And, you know, our, our old traditions and our old histories do bring a lot of that, but it doesn't always tend to make it into the academic uh, record or written down and published in the same way. And those script documents I mentioned, which was part of our dispossession, uh, provide valuable information, but they don't capture that daily life piece. When I first started this work, I started to dig into what had been done. So the first thing we do when we start a, a research project, we say, okay, what, what do we know about this area? Who's done research in this? What kinds of data are they using? What kinds of you know, theoretical frameworks are they using? And for me, this took me to some research that had been done in the 1970s and 1980s at some core places in the homeland. There's an important site at Batash, Saskatchewan, where the second uh, resistance was defeated. There was some work on the battlefield there. There was some work at overwintering sites, which I, well, I'll come back to, which are sites of uh, Métis use in the second half of the 19th century. The work that was done in the 1970s and 1980s was very much grounded in those Western systems of knowledge. And the frameworks that the archaeologists who were not Métis themselves were using really emphasized a few key things. One, how we were trying to be like our European cousins. So the use of particular European objects in particular ways, how our material culture was mixed. So again, that sort of default to this mixedness as the, the, defining, um, the, the defining characteristic of being Métis and trying to apply that to the materiality of the past through you know, statistical analyses and things like this. And assuming that some of the other types of technology that Métis people may have been using, such as stone tools, were not actually Métis. They must have been from earlier First Nations because Métis folks wouldn't do that. Immediately, these struck me as not being attentive to our ways of understanding ourselves and not being attentive to our ways of knowing, uh, and therefore, creating narratives that actually did not represent us at all. And this is what took me to Amida. So then I started the Amida project as a Métis-led archeological project. I went to my relatives and to our political organizations and said, what do we want to, what can archeology span do for you? What kind of questions would be of interest? Where should we go? What kind of things do we want to look at? The first one was, can you establish us in the archeological record so we can look at where we were? And that was a big part of the first part. Again, it sort of brings me back to my own family and my own history, trying to build a project around this. But in particular, I brought in a different framework. So I mentioned that earlier archeology span was very much from a Western framework. 
This is my model of how I do archaeology from a Métis framework. This is an image of the Voyager sash. It's a really important symbol in contemporary Métis communities today and is a finger woven long sash often worn as a belt or used for a variety of purposes by our ancestors and marks family relations in a lot of cases. Certain patterns and colors are related to particular type, particular Métis families. For me, the sash became a really important touch point of how I wanted to approach the archeological record itself and perhaps the scientific methods that I was gonna use because really what I was interested in is the interweaving of a series of threads. And I identified based on some work of colleagues and, and my own kind of understandings, brought in five threads of the sash. So we have Métis mobility and geography, very large homeland, that homeland is also the location of many other First Nations uh, territories. And then we moved through that landscape extensively. A lot of uh, scholarship on the Métis has talked about our mobility and how we move over vast parts of the land at, at various times of year. That relates to our economic practice. So part of the reason that that movement happened was economic. And part of that was about the types of activities we were engaged in. But there's also Métis daily life, that kind of day-to-day -day activities of, of our families. But you'll notice that the red thread, which is the most prominent in the, in the sash, is Métis relations. And I mean both kin with our human relatives, but also with lands and waters and animals and plants and other than human beings. And it is the, the most clear thread in all of these others. And you can't pull these threads apart and understand them in isolation. This is not a reproduction of that taxonomy. The emphasis here is that you could only understand Métis history through the interweaving of these, through how they all interconnect. And it's in that interconnection that knowledge about the past can be generated. So I'm just gonna really briefly with the time I have left run you through how this works on the ground at some of the sites that we do archeological research on. The sites that we've really tended to focus on are Métis overwintering sites. Métis were, we were big bison hunters back when there were bison to hunt. And especially in sort of 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, we create these really large bison hunting brigades of you know hundreds of people who would be going out to hunt bison. As the population started to be impacted, we had to go further and further afield from our settlements in order to hunt bison. And what happened is those groups of families started to build sites on near where bison spent the winter. So overwintering or hivernant, which is from the French winter and building these collections of cabins out on the prairie or in the parklands. These are distinctly Métis places. The vast majority of people living there would have been Métis. So archeologically, they're very interesting because they give us a good snapshot of a Métis way of life. One of the sites that we've worked on and we applied a bunch of scientific methods and uh, to is the Chimney Coulee site. This is a site not too far from the US border in Southwestern Saskatchewan, which is one of the prairie provinces. It is uh, a recognized site because it had multiple occupations during the, especially 1860s to 1880s. There's also a much more ancient settlement there as well, but we haven't dealt too deeply into that. And it is one of a set of overwintering sites where archaeology has been done. We came to this site in part because it had these multiple occupations. So from a, you know, archaeological or scientific perspective, it allows us to compare. So what different types of groups of people were doing at the site at different times. We could evaluate whether it actually had a material record. Um, so were there observable differences between these different occupations? We also wanted to map the site. One of my approaches to indigenous archeology span is also to do as much as we can above ground without digging because the first instinct of many indigenous communities is not to dig up the past, even if they're interested in learning about it. So finding ways to explore the subsurface using scientific methods of geophysics has really been helpful in that. And then some targeted excavation where we sort of follow archeological practice, do our excavations and things like that. I wanna show you a couple of our cool scientific results. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how I've integrated sort of cultural teachings into this work and how that's informed us moving forward. 
one of the really cool results that we had is we used ground penetrating radar, sends an electromagnetic uh, wave down into the ground to look for changes and anomalies. We were able to apply this particular method and detect the actual walls of a cabin. And we ground truth this, so we thought we saw it on the ground penetrating radar data, and then we went and we dug it up and we saw it also in the earth itself. And this really helped us to build an understanding of the orientation of the cabin, of kind of where activity areas might be, very valuable use of the scientific method. We were able to, again, um, observe that wall in multiple data formats, right? So in the actual physical ground itself, it looks like this really woody trench, but that is, you know, quite, quite straight. And, and then we were able to see it also on that ground penetrating radar. So application of a scientific method to help us understand the material culture um, and, and get some really interesting results. The other thing that we do in our excavation is that we tend to excavate very carefully when we're doing a Métis archaeology, and that is in part because Métis folks are known, we're known for our beadwork. So we're known for creating elaborate floral beadwork that was essential to Métis relations, so primarily created by women, but primarily worn by men on, you know, gauntlets and jackets and vests and octopus bags, which would hold ammunition and other things. Distinct beadwork patterns to Métis broadly, but also to specific families and specific beaders that became very important. And um, also were often sold uh, for, for economic gains so that the women would participate in that way. When we design our methods to find these tiny, you know, one to three millimeter gla drawn glass seed beads in the archaeological record, they are by far the most common belonging that we find. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we can find patterns. So we had at Chimicooli, my graduate student Eric Tebby was working there in 2017, and he came across this beadwork pattern. We were able, using scientific methods, to preserve this, remove it out of the ground intact, solidify the soil around it so that we wouldn't lose that pattern. And we see that same pattern on other materials from the same era. And this, these are um, embroidered, but there's a very similar kind of flower bud. This is a flower bud in the beadwork. And this is a really clear example of our way in the archaeological record. But perhaps more importantly to me, it was a way in which to engage some cultural teachings, um, some knowledge from, from our Métis elders and knowledge holders with archaeology itself that has transformed how I approach archaeology. And in this case, it's a concept called Wakotuin. So Wakotuin is a Cree word, and many of my family's uh, connections have been with, with Cree uh, ancestors. And Wakotuin is it doesn't easily translate into English, but it's often translated as being a good relation or being, uh, you know, all my relations. But it's actually a concept, a law, and a practice. It's about respecting and honoring the relations that we do have, maintaining them in ways that are responsible and that respect those relations. So in my work, Artifacts are not artifacts, they're belongings. They're the belongings of my relatives and they are also my relatives. And they then require me to build those reciprocal relations between myself and between these materials that my ancestors left behind. So in order to live Wakotuin, I need to care for my relations with these belongings. And that means also bringing in Things like visiting. So visiting is so essential to Métis ways of connecting. Spending time around the kitchen table, drinking tea, chatting, visiting, beating together. And therefore, this particular belonging is one that I visit with. And that when my Métis relatives come to see me, my, my human relatives, I have them visit with my relations. And this is very much reflecting our way of knowing and our way of understanding the past and upholding those cultural values. And in the last like minute that I have, I just really want to emphasize one more piece. What happens to that belonging is still determined by a Western framework. That belonging has to go to a museum according to the law 
of the province at which it was found. And I think this brings up a whole set of questions about who owns the data, uh, who owns that information, who owns that knowledge, right? That that relative is there, but we have to hand it over to an institution which may not care for it in the ways that we might want to. So this always brings up questions around ethics, around data sovereignty, around who has access to data, who decides. We hear this big movement toward open data, but in Indigenous contexts, I always say, who's deciding the data is open, right? And that's really important. How do we care for the belongings of our ancestors? How do we care for the data that's generated out of bringing in Indigenous knowledge into science? And then how do we empower Indigenous people for us to do our own science on our own terms? So I'm working on this in my context, don't have time to go into this in detail, but basically I'm building a different kind of database that will center our ways of knowing rather than reproducing what archaeologists have done before, uh, that centers connection and story and family rather than materiality or the particular data that tells us where it's from in the earth. And this really will bring uh, these relations back into our community today. So to sum up, Indigenous knowledge systems are valid. They have specific contexts and histories that need to be respected. Ceremony, Indigenous knowledge um, need to be really specific to the relationships that are being built between the communities and scientists. Uh, and in archaeology, it needs to be specific to the location in which we're working. It's important to consider this from conception all the way to what happens with the data at the end, and that you build relations all the way through that to really understand how these cultural teachings can inform our practice. And it's important to understand the, chal the challenge that Indigenous knowledge presents to a lot of Western frameworks, asking for a different way to generate and understand the world around us. Hi, hi, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Supernut, for the amazing presentation. Um, as a reminder to all attendees, um, the best way to get uh, your answer or your question, your questions answered, is to type it in the Q Q and A. There is a button. Um, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom page. So go ahead and put your questions in there, and I will. Uh, read those out to Dr. Supernaut and Dr. Supernaut can um, talk more about those. So um, right now we have two questions. And so the first one, it says, Dr. Keisha Supernaut, to clarify your statement, are you saying that we cannot tell anything about race or ethnicity from bones? And what are good references or books related to this topic? I thank you for that question. So the a couple of things to note, there still are areas that use certain characteristics. Forensics is a really common one where they use these characteristics of, of, of bones to try to say this is the you know Caucasian or Asian or whatever. But the truth is, is that biologically, there is no racial difference in our population. We're a continuum. Right? But there's no sort of like this race and that race and this race because of the sort of continuum of all traits. This is a broader conversation that more relates to biological anthropology and, and I'm an archeologist, but I certainly can provide you with some, some resources. I was just actually I'm quite active on Twitter at Archeomapper if you're curious. And one of the things is uh, there's conversations happening at the American Association of Biological Anthropologists right now as to how we need to move away from these categorizing of, of bones into certain races because Racism is real, and, and race is real in a social way, in that it is seen and experienced by people, but it actually has no biological basis. And uh, so that's the way in which science, scientific knowledge has advanced to really understand that there is no sort of clear division between, between groups. Um, and that was actually used as a lot of justification to do a lot of harm to a lot of different people around the world. So hopefully I can um, maybe follow up with some specific uh, sources, but there should be plenty out there for you to, to learn more about this. Thank you. Uh, so the next question says, have you studied the crossover of the meaning of, uh, the word is 
spelled W A H K O T O W A N versus Pajon in Navajo? I haven't directly, but I imagine there, from my experience, there's similar concepts in a lot of Indigenous um, knowledge systems, right? So we hear similar types of ideas and concepts that talk about, you know, those relations. And um, so this is where, when I was talking broadly about some of the things we can see that cross cut our, our different nations, this is one of them I think we see quite commonly. So I haven't directly uh, looked at Wakotuin and Bojo, but I would imagine it'd be really interesting to have that conversation and, and see where those connections might lie um, in terms of the particular types of responsibilities and, and practices that go alongside them. Great. Uh, so the next question is, uh, Dr. Supernaut spoke a lot about interwoven and connectedness instead of categorization and separation. Could you give an example of knowledge systems different from the scientific focus on senses slash observation slash skepticism slash testing? Sure, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer that question. Um, although, as I would like to say, I feel like when it comes to Indigenous knowledge, I'm still like in kindergarten as opposed to having a PhD as I do in Western knowledge systems. I guess I would think about it this way. Um, I'll give you an example. In uh, Cree, the word for rock is animate. So asini is connected to other things that are animate. And within the language itself, it is encoded that, well, you know, we can see and touch and hold a rock. What makes it a rock is not only what we can see and touch and hold, it's also its animate nature. And this, again, comes to this question of spirit and how you, know, you can't necessarily separate out that concept of spirit and animation from the physical object itself. So while there's an element of observation in it, you observe the rock, its meaning and its place in the world is differently understood based on those things that are less observable through the senses of, you know, smell, sight, taste, touch. Uh, and in a similar way, so the beadwork pattern that I shared with you, one of my, one of the knowledge holders with whom I work, talked a lot about the fact that the bead itself doesn't hold spirit. So the bead is a bead. But when the bead is made into a pattern, pattern holds spirit. So that particular pattern maintains the spirit of the woman who created it 150, 200 years ago. And that's a very different conception than like I can count the number of beads and I can, you know, but it's the knowledge that that brings is more than just the pattern itself. It's that connection to the ancestor. And it's that connection to a continued practice of Métis beading that can't only be assessed through that observation. At the same time, a lot of Indigenous knowledge systems absolutely had systems of observation. I mean, even the, the process of understanding what is edible in, in the world around you requires observation, experimentation, and there's a rich history of that in Indigenous systems, but it can't just be reduced to that because there's a lot more to, to the knowledge system than just those, those parts um, of observation. So hopefully that, that answers the question to an extent. Uh, so the next question is, I work manage, uh, I work man, I work and manage an institutional repository. So I was interested in your comments on open data. Based on your experience, how can libraries support the preservation and sharing of Indigenous research? This is a great question, and I'm really glad that that you asked it because I think that there's a lot of knowledge that actually currently sits in libraries and in archives that is Indigenous knowledge. And as we start to see this push toward making things easily accessible online, um, you know, I think there brings in some important ethics around who decides what should be made available in which ways. And there's been quite a bit of literature on this. I, I don't have sources off the top of my head, but certainly if you wanted to follow up with me, I could send some along around kind of decolonizing the libraries and archives. And I think the question should always be asked, you know, who should make a decision about something being open? We, of course, have Western systems like copyright and, and certain sorts of things that constrain, um, but we also have the ideas like the public domain, right? So this idea that there's things in the public domain that can be freely shared, but that can include pictures of Indigenous ancestors. I think about a collection at, um, at my university of medical images, which sit in our sort of library and archives, some of which are really problematic. <laughs> 
in terms of what they represent. And so I think there always needs to be that question of, you know, why are we making it open? Who's making the decision? And working with Indigenous knowledge holders, making sure that they're supported to engage, to talk about what that might mean. And um, this is something I think about a lot in my own work, because most of my ancestors, my relatives are like, tell everyone everything about us, right? There's a real sense of wanting to share, but to share on our own terms, not to have other people sharing on our behalf, but to do it on our own terms. So I think starting with build, trying to build relations with wherever you might be located, um, if there's Indigenous initiatives on your campus or in your library or in your, your area, to try and engage in that, because so much can then emerge out of those relations. Um, but I just, in my own discipline, again, there's been this push like, let's make all the data open. I'm like, well, but that's Indigenous data and who's deciding? And we can't default to that it should be open because many times our knowledge systems have different understandings of what should be shared and not. And certain, you know, songs belong to certain families. And if recordings of those songs travel out into the world, they're not connected to that ownership from that family, right? Who has the rights to those songs. So there's things like that that need to be considered. But the best advice I can give is start having the conversation with Indigenous people around what that should look like. So we have time for maybe uh, one or two more questions. So the next one is, um, do you feel we need to reform university practices or create alternatives to university research in order to ensure the best anthropological research and documentation? I mean, I definitely think that the institutions in which we find ourselves, and particularly universities, do tend to enshrine particular knowledge systems and, and ways of understanding. Um, even though there's diversity within what we learn at, at university, it does tend to be grounded in particular ways of knowing. Um, and I definitely think that there are ways that we can change university uh, systems to better support this. One example might be in how we evaluate work. So as someone who does a lot of work with my community, I spend a lot of time visiting with my relatives. It takes often you know, years to get projects off the ground because you have to start from a place of relation. You can't just sort of show up and say, I'm gonna do this project that's not ethical and that's not Wakotuan. That's not always reflected in my research productivity and what the university expects me to do. And trying to articulate that the visiting part of the work is the work, like that it may not have this you know, high impact journal article that immediately comes out of it, but it is essential to being a good relation and being able to do this practice. So for me, there's different ways that we can consider um, how the university can shift. Another really big one is teaching. So how we teach students about what our disciplines are. And I've really shifted my pedagogy to be like, you know, framing archeology span is what we know it is, but also, what its history is and how it has marginalized and excluded particular types of perspectives and voices. And if I teach that right when students are understanding what archeology span is, they take it with them. And as they go off and practice in various ways, they will continue to have that in the back of their mind and think about how that impacts their practice. So teaching also to me is also such an important part of this um, moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Shupranat. Um, thank you so much for answering those questions. We will uh, go ahead and move on to our second speaker for today. Um, our second speaker today is uh, Dr. Tommy Roth. Dr. Tommy Roth is a member of the Navajo Nation from Monument Valley, Utah. Dr. Roth received his PhD in Earth, Earth Science and Environmental Sustainability and hopes to integrate issues of health, environment, and culture, especially related to uranium mining, into more informed decision making on tribal lands. As a citizen of the Navajo Nation, Dr. Roth advocates for addressing issues of uranium contamination by drawing on Navajo culture, meaning that any policies which are developed should use Navajo fundamental laws that could help make the policies more effective. The use of such traditional ecological knowledge can help the tribe improve their quality of life concerning uranium contamination. Uh, Dr. Roth, uh, I turn the time over to you. Uh, 
Dr. Rock, we can't hear you. Dr. Rock, we still can't hear you. Uh, I don't really know. Um, Dr. Rock, you might maybe like consider like leaving and then coming back maybe. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why we cannot hear you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Just give us a couple of minutes to kind of figure some things out. Dr. Rock, I think you should um, like leave the, uh, the Zoom and then come back because um, I, I think potentially that could work. Um, Dr. Henry Fowler, are you available potentially to present yeah, at I'm, this time? I'm here. Okay. Uh, is that okay if you uh, present, present second? Uh, yes. Cool. Um, so let me uh, let me introduce you, and then I will hand the floor over to you. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Henry Fowler. Dr. Henry Fowler is from Tonalia, Arizona. He is a member of the Navajo Tribe and associate professor of mathematics at the at the uh, Navajo Technical University in Crown Point, New Mexico. Dr. Fowler is a part is born for bitter water and born into the Zuni of water. His maternal grandparents are many goats, and his paternal grandparents are thread running into the water. Dr. Fowler is the co-founder of the Navajo Math Circles, which provides teacher workshops for grades K through 12 and works with other with over 40 mathematicians to promote math education for students from the Navajo Nation. Dr. Fowler, I turn it over to you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate um, Utah State University for putting out a indigenous ways of knowing. So my topic will be particularly about um, from the mathematics site about indigenous ways of knowing. I'm a bitter water from my mother's side, born for Zuni Edgewater, father's side and many goats paternal grandfather and the red running into the water from a paternal grandfather. I am a math faculty at Navajo Technical University, um, a Navajo, one of the Navajo tribal institution higher education in Crown Point, New Mexico. I am the co-founder of Navajo Masterclass. We have um, a group of mathematicians across the states that come and support my initiative to promote math education for my Navajo people, Navajo students, and Navajo communities. We do um, work with mathematicians. We run Masterclass. We have our annual math festival, summer math camp, and integrate Navajo culture to teach mathematics. And I really support this initiative for our students to find opportunities and strength within themselves and find their passion so that they can choose a career in STEM. I truly believe that um, math education is one of the back support to build our nation's infrastructure. And as mathematicians, we feel that we are excluded from K through 12 grade education. So mathematicians have different backgrounds, different careers. So it's a good opportunity for students to engage in how mathematicians would think about mathematics rather than from the dominant way of thinking of math through Western education. The indigenous ways of um, knowing is through one of, um, is this is a Navajo Hogan and it faces east in, the, in that direction. And we chart how the sun travels. We capture everything that, um, in, that enters our space into the Hogan. So this is the, the direction the, the line here that's um, when we open the door here that represents um, the equinox in March and September. And then the one that's on the north side that is the summer um, solstice and then the winter solstice. So this is captured inside the Hogan and the elders would mark their ash on the Hogan walls here on the poles. And then also they align and then make the connections to the um, constellations in the four seasons. So we chart and we understand ourself, our identity in relationship to how the constellation moves in the seasons in the fall, winter, spring and summer. And this is this how we build the Hogan from the indigenous view, from my culture, from the Navajo site, is that there's two people that they um, create the yucca rope. So one would be at the center location, and then one would be at point A. So the point A person would be the walker. And the earth becomes our canvas. So it becomes a blank sheet of paper in a sense. So this person would motion and clockwise and drag his or her feet 
on earth and create the circle using the yakaru. So this is a space of connections, relationship to our cosmos and to who we are as our Navajo uh, family has done for many centuries. And they would um, trade off, one would stand here at point A and then the walker would be at this location here to create this particular arc on the plane. And Navajo, we believe that symmetry is a form of thinking. So what we do one side, we carry out to the other side. So point B is the same practice. So we create this um, perpendicular here. And then as well as the diameter between A to B to create the perpendicular lines here. Within this structure, we formulate the um, equilateral triangle vertices F, D, and G, and as well as E, H, and, and C here. And when we open the Hogan doors, or Hogan door here, the light will come in the shaft early in the morning when the sun comes out and it'll hit the Hogan wall here. So from my ancestors teaching using the charcoal, the ash, they would draw the Orion with this particular constellation here, representing um, the winter constellation here. Also similar with the summer solstice. So that would be the Scorpius and they would write the constellation on the wall here. And the Corvus is a divider between the seasons. So that will be representing with an equal knots and the Corvus will be marked in this representation here. So between um, E and H, all the constellations would be charted out throughout the whole entire year. So that's, this is, creates our thinking, who we are as Navajo people. And perpendicular, um, represented like this, according to our Navajo elders, they said it represents the start of everything, where the two lines come together. It's a very sacred, um, where things emerges, where things becomes. So a buckskin would be created and it fold, it's folded in half to create the two equal parts, the symmetry. And the center is where everything begins, the emergence, our thought, planning, life, and reflection. Through this process that we mature and we develop ourselves our self-identity, who we are as Navajo people. Through this process, we, we do tests and we verify. And we also relate to our space, location, and our becomes our measurement. And the perpendicular is also um, constructed here. It's where we create the geometric constructions using the perpendicular bisector. So this is a process that we fold the buckskins, we fold the sheepskin, and we create these nice symmetrical um, shape. And using this idea, we can relate this um, perpendicular bisector to create and transform into circles into various patterns of different shapes and symmetry based on where folding occurs, where perpendicular bisector happens, where our origin begins, where everything is erected. So it's just like for myself, I come from Tanalia, and this is the practice from my ancestors that live in that area, continue to be shared with my generation, who we are as the Bitterwater people, and this process um, about folding 
in creating the Navajo sand painting where earth and the father sky, they collaborate and work in harmony in Hojo and they catch so from this is the art of our intellectual mind, who we are as the indigenous people. And our existence of the Navajo custom and tradition is based on three principles, is positive relationship with everything. So we also include our land where we're from, our ancestor tied to that particular land and how history develops from that particular place, how we learn our songs, our chants and our relationship with our people that, that we live there with. So from that, we relate with a connection with positive relationship. You're my sister, you're my aunt, you're my father, you're my mother. And also we relate to our environment as well with the cosmos and with the universe and with the earth. The ideal state of Navajo mind is to have hojo, the state of condition of peace in our mind. So the more that we have this peace, the innovation will come, ideas will come, information will come to us and we bless ourselves with it and we massage our mind with it so that we grow and that we mature and we develop into who we are as the creator make us human Navajo people. So based on a Navajo approach to thinking is holistic approach using the three core principle so that was the ideal of the triangulation that I drew that was drawn in the Hogan. So that is erected and that we able to carry ourselves as Navajo, we call it is able to think that the mind has the power to reason that the mind has the power to create things, that from our thinking we plan, which is associated with the South, and the thinking is associated with the East. And the West is life that we create for ourselves, the environment that we create, and we extend into our environment who we are as the people. In return, we do see Hassan is to do our restoration, stability through our mind to do the reflection. And our elders would tell us that reflection becomes our prayer, that the reflection becomes our songs. The so that's the power of the reflection in Navajo way of thinking. So this becomes our physical wellness and we're able to care through, through connection with our environment, through our core principle, we formulate and make that relationship with ourself. So we always continue to learn who we are as Navajo people, no matter what stage that we are at in life. And part of our wellness is to grow socially, to able to relate to one another, to relate to yourself so that you have this positive vision that you are at peace, that you are at hujong, that you are in balance. And the mind, the psychological part is very important in Navajo. It's up to you how you carry yourself. It's up to you how you represent your family, your teaching from your heritage, your custom based on hujong. 
and Haikehalon. So our principles always is about relationship situations and about making the interconnection with peace. And the spirituality is very important in Navajo. So Navajo, we look at the word um, sa means to mature and, and naga is to a repetition, a cycle. So we have a cycle of life, birth will happen. We have this conception, birth, then your middle age and then to old age. And we have the four seasons, the four directions. So life is about a cycle. It's about always repetition. And it grows from your thinking, your planning, your life, and your reflection to take action upon yourself so that you make the best that you can to construct a creative life for yourself in balance and in harmony. So this is the art of who we are as Navajo people in the indigenous way of learning. So they say that is to unify the worldview, is to accept culture, to accept relationship to the wildlife, to the insect people. And the insect is above us. The wildlife is above us. We're not above them. So we're part of this ecological system, as well as we relate to other five-finger people in harmony, in a good way, in a good blessing. So my mother um, always taught us that this is the teaching of our four, forefathers to realize new information. So information will come to us. And these are not just limited. So one way of information that comes is through our powerful observation. Um, so observation is to develop your mind, and watch and observe and, and do what you observe and do the action. So from that is the teaching, the experimental teaching comes. And we work together as family, the core system, the relationship in a collaborative manner, even though things can be debated. Things may not debate it in a positive way, but that we also work in towards and balance and accepting our own um, different viewpoints, perspective of family members in a collaboration. So we work together and respect one another and respect other people's opinions. And especially the listen to the earth, observe the earth and observe the, the cosmos and the universe. So my elders, they always had marked their Hogan walls and they related to um, the solstice and the equinox. And they noticed that through their time that their equinox where they drew their ash line, it's been like one degree off from years in the past. So they view because of this change, they see this, world as changing, the climate change happening, it's getting warmer. And then we also learn by actively engage doing, doing the activity. So it's a really where family comes together. We, we do things in an active fashion and we learn by comparing and contrasting things together. That's how learning takes place. So this is just a few um, learning information that our elders point out to us as Navajo people. And this is one of the indigenous um, clan system, a Navajo clan system. Um, this represents you, 
sh, and then your mother and your father. So you inherit their clan and the mother's clan. That's who you are. That's who, that's the clan group that you will always represent. And it's the idea that the father is the second clan and their clan people and your mother's um, grand, their parents and your father's parents. So that's make you who you are as Navajo person. But teaching this um, phenomena in mathematics, you can teach this as exponential, as exponents, um, like two to zero power will represent one. So that's she, who you are. So this teaching also infused into Navajo students. You let them know about the importance of our clan system, where they come from, the demographic, the landscape. And it's very important that the students learn the landscape, the history that comes from there that builds their self-identity. And two to the first power would represent two. So the parents, your mother and your father. And two to the second power would represent four, your grandparents. And two to the third power would represent the. So Navajo, we analyze patterns and Mathematics is no exception, it's all about pattern. So pattern helps us to make congestures, um, conclusions and able to create equations and create um, our own hypothesis. So two to the third power would be uh, representing um, the second generation of this group here. So that would be um, two to the third is two times two. And that's four, four times two is um, eight. So it will be representing uh, your grandparents, their parents, where they come from. So this is the art of teaching for Navajo is not just teaching math, but you relate it to their clan system. You relate it to their self-identity their interconnection, who they are as Navajo. And the Navajo master course, um, I started to create um, educational posters because many of our education posters that are in classrooms, they're from um, elsewhere from different company that produces um, math posters. So this one is a replica of our um, Navajo teaching that the early dawn light and also the blue daylight, the twilight, the evening light and the darkness, the creator put it together and they formulated the Navajo Hogan. So that becomes our home, Navajo Hogan. So in the Western form of teaching in math education is to teach the order of operation is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, which is not really relevant for our Navajo students, there's a disconnection. But if you teach the meaning about who we are using metaphors, using the emergence, the cultural stories that the early dawn represents to do the quantities, the brackets, the parentheses, and to do the blue color, the, which is daylight, the day, and you do the exponents and the evening twilight, the evening. You do and carry out the multiplication division using left to right and so Navajo is always about left to right motion. 
so so and the same process doing the order of operation and the darkness represents addition and subtraction so as, as the students scaffolding the learning you can begin with darkness and where you can talk about how the creation started so you can use different operations from darkness and arrange the number to do the problems, quantifying using subtraction and addition, then you can add the yellow color multiplication as well as the division, then introduce exponent, then introduce quantities. So students can color code the system and when they color code and relate to this process, they can relate to themselves who they are. And you also teach um, Navajo character too, the character about religion, about peace, about emotions, about um, self-discipline, who you are as a Navajo person. So you're teaching, you're integrating holistic thinking. At the same time, you're teaching um, the concept about math. And also um, the teaching about corn too. We use the white cornmeal to pray, to set our mind, the frame, who we are as the ne people, Navajo people. So we stand towards the east and we sprinkle. And that sets the stage for us, that sets our tone of life our thought, what we're going to say, and how we're going to say it in a good way, positive way, so that we're blessed with abundance of good thought, planning, and life, and reflection. So that represents equilateral triangle. You tell the students about the core meal, the importance about working hard, um, doing your garden, doing your field, planting, the ancient corn seeds that we use and, and then teaching about the wellness, about the students, the social aspect, the, psych the psychology, as well as the spiritual part about who you are as a Dene person. Then the isosceles is about the two white corn ears here. And in relationship, we use the, the yellow corn meal to pray to the West for um, setting our, accomplishing our goals and then revisiting who we are and doing our tomorrow that a new day begins, a new horizon begins for us. And the scaling will be the different ears of corn, different colors. So the students relate this in in perspective also to angles and learning about Navajo math, as well as um, the Western math integrated together. So this way of teaching the students able to explore, they do their inquiry, they ask questions to themselves, they look for um, their prior knowledge, the prior knowledge gives them connections, they use small examples to understand, to argue, they, they draw pictures, um, they, they draw models, they relate this to equations, and they formulate their hypothesis, their conjectures, and their conjectures is what help them understand mathematics. Um, so in the so i also started to create um poems in math so that students could appreciate um the beauty of mathematics the the beauty of um how math is important that math is integrated in our culture math is defined and from navajo view is in relationship 
to our body, to our handstand, to our fingers, and as well as to symmetry, and as well as to proportions, ratios, and extending out into our perpendicular, how we create the grid, and that everything is done mentally in our mind. So this is with the help of my mother, and I asked her how, how math to her is from a Navajo elder person. And this is what she said, the spirit of math. My mind is embedded with the spirit of math. My mind is filled with numerations. I use parts of my body to measure and numerate. I weave using the sacred spirit of math. I use math in my weaving. Walk in harmony with the spirit of math. Walk in beauty with the spirit of math. Walk in all directions with the spirit of math. My children, may the spirit of math flow in your life. So that's from my mother, how she interprets math. She has a special bond, a special relationship. And when that special relationship, it brings peace and calm so that she able to numerate, she able to measure using her parts of her body and the parts of her body turns to ratios, proportions, to fractions, and becomes a number sense and able to bring that sense of space into her own space using mathematics from indigenous ways, from the Navajo way of life. So Navajo is always about um, to walk in beauty. Um, and you walk beauty before I walk, beauty behind me. Uh, the beauty above me, around me, and, and beauty again all around. So Navajo is, is restoring yourself with peace first, who you are as a person, as an indigenous person. And so this is this um, part of the presentation um, since we had a little bit um, to keep on time with the timeline that we have here. This is the presentation from the indigenous part about mathematics, just a little touch of it. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Um, as mentioned previously, if you have questions for Dr. Fowler, please put it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of Zoom. That way we can get to your questions. Um, there are two questions currently, and so I can ask those to you, Dr. Fowler. The first question is, can we please have access to this information? I think you're talking about like the charts and stuff that, are, that were in your presentation. Yeah, a lot of these um, math posters that um, I've been creating, it's been through, I guess, years of studying ethnomathematics, that's what I specialize, is working with um, our elders and, and just, just the, their perception, their ideas. And so from their ideas that the creation of um, these math posters would um, be created. So. Um, you can email me and that's how you can have access to these materials. And it's my first name, Henry underscore H F as in Frank at hotmail.com. Great, uh, so we have another question here. It says, Dr. Fowler, I'm trying to support my Navajo students respectfully in a, in a diverse school. Would it be all right to share these learning tools? For example, the geometry of light in a Hogan with non-Navajo non or non-Native students as well. Would that be disrespectful of the cultural importance of these ideas? Um, I think that's the more that we see the world as 
from different diverse background, and especially today's um, time, that technology we're using to connect, to, um, to create, to be a family, to understand about each other. So it's a great opportunity to um, Zoom. You can, you can contact me, the email that I gave you, where I could present to your class or to help you with some of these um, connection with your students in class. If there's um, Navajo students, then we can talk and we can create some engaging, um, how to engage with Navajo students or indigenous students and how to work in harmony with them so that they are able to elicit and draw ideas and questions from them. Thank you. The next question is, I really like this question. It says, when did you have the realization that math and Navajo traditions were interweaved? Um, my mother, um, she never went to uh, Western education. She's um, in her 80s and my father is 107. Um, we, so every, everything that, that how they, they taught me about geometry, Navajo rug weaving, um, how they dye their yarns and this everyday life that we did. There was always um, mathematics. So I think our language, Navajo language is very important because it brings the, the abstract thinking to our mind. So that the language is, is very powerful in Navajo to develop that mind to think critically, to synthesize and to draw um, conclusions. Great. The next question here, um, and this one says, how has this been received by your students? What impacts has it made in their lives? Uh, yeah, what, what impacts has it made in their lives? I've been studying, um, studying ethno-mathematics ever since I was a high school math teacher. Um, I always wanted to inspire um, young mind. And I, I, my first teaching was at Ray Mesa High School near the Four Corners. So right out of my graduate study from NAU, I was placed in, in a real classroom where it's not really taught at university education system. So I came, I graduated in December um, in, at NAU and I came to Red Mesa in January. So it's just a few weeks from my graduation. So I was put in there with no textbooks, nothing. And I think um, it, it was good for me because I, it was good for me to invent things, to produce things and relate to the students what they understand about animals, about their horses, about their corral, how they're shaped at home and using those cultural knowledge that they have um, at home, bring that into the classroom space. So that's how my teaching started for me as, as a person. The next question is, uh, is this information shared exclusively through Mac Circles camps and not across public schools on the Diné Reservation? Yeah, the, the Navajo math um, circle started back in 2012 when I was at um, Dena College. And, and one was to promote math education for Navajo students. I, I see as injustice from my view is how Western education, Western math textbooks especially conveying thinking that this way is math, but there is more math um, from different perspectives, different viewpoints, especially from mathematicians. So that's how this Navajo Master Course was created is to bring math mathematicians and, and the number one goal was also to integrate 
the cultural piece, the language piece, so that the students um, realize that within their own experience, within what they do at home, that everything that is their experience is also mathematics, especially their culture and their heritage has strong mathematics. I have uh, two more questions here and uh, I'm gonna put them together. They're pretty short questions. The first one says, thank you. And do you have the math charts on sale? And then the next question is, what is the hardest concepts to teach your students in the classroom? Um, the math charts on sales. I'm not sure what that one is about, but. I think what they mean is like, can you buy the math charts somewhere? Oh yeah, you, yeah, you can purchase the math posters from me um, by emailing me, not just these math posters, but there's many more that I have. I can send you the brochure and you can um, look at what math posters are available. And the, the second part of that, um, that sort of questions was, what is the hardest concepts to teach your students in the classroom? Um, the hardest to teach is for students to be critical thinkers to, um, I, I always strive for students to create their own learning about math. There's, those, there's no, if you teach students by procedures, step by step to arrive at an answer, but to teach students to think in multiple representations, multiple connections and, and find their own true way of thinking about these math and I always relate back to um, make your own congesture, make your own meaning uh, out of these problems. And is there another way that you can do these problems? Is there another way that you can relate to these problems from your background, from your experience, or from your own um, process of understanding these information, the math topics? So I think that's the hardest to do because they're, they're so inclined to be taught by um, drill and by procedures and one way and copy me and do what I copy on the board. That's how it's usually taught mathematics in classrooms. Dr. Fowler, um, there was a couple questions. If we can just type your email address into the chat. And so um, if you read it out to me, or you can also put it in the chat as well, whatever works. So my, um, it's in the chat, my email address. Okay. I will. Okay, so great, it's in there. Um, everybody attending, you should be able to have access to the chat and in the chat, Dr. Fowler's email address is, is in the chat. Um, we have one more question. Uh, it says, there is a big push in open education resources to develop textbooks that are more inclusive of practices and systems of knowledge outside of Western practices. Do you think what you've presented today can be respectfully integrated into open resources to be used by white instructors and students? Yeah, the key word is inclusive and equality and justice, social justice for, for all um, people. I think the more that we share resources, the more that we um, share different viewpoints and understanding, especially from the indigenous mathematics, ethno-mathematics point of view. There's, there's nothing wrong about um, teaching. And I always tell my, uh, my students that are teacher candidates is to be effective teachers, 
to find your voice, um, find that yourself and who you are. So if you are a teacher that's trying to teach indigenous math, find your voice and find that confidence in yourself and reach out to people because there are now beginning to be plenty of resources out there from different indigenous people creating these cultural relevant um, curriculum materials. So all it takes is just um, reach out and um, partnership. And then also the Navajo Master Pools, the two year um, pandemic now, we've been sort of like, um, sort of doing more like a virtual type of math. So um, reach out to me, it's on Navajo Master Pools. If you Google that, it's a free of service to teachers, to educators, to students. Okay, Dr. Fowler, that is all the questions we have for you today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you everybody who presented questions for for the the two uh, the two presenters today. At this time, we will go ahead and take a five minute break. Um, and then uh, our last presenter is um, Dr. Tommy Roth. And in five minutes, we'll, we'll have him on and he will present next. So have a nice five minute break. And Dr. Roth, do you mind trying your audio again? We still can't hear you. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what the issue might be. Tommy, what kind of computer do you have? Um, can you type it in the chat? And then send it to me directly if you could. Hello? Oh, we heard that, but there's a bit of an echo. Okay. Yeah, that's it's the other laptop. I don't know what's going on. I've been doing research and we've been having trouble at the beginning of the of our research. So it's, the technology issues continues <laughs> doing, doing field work. So yeah, at least this um, laptop is working, which is which is great. That is good. Do you have um, a PowerPoint for us today that will be easily? That you can transfer over to this other laptop. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like um, I have it, and I will share screen. Okay, perfect. Let's see, can you hear me? Am I am I coming in clear now? You are coming in good. All right. And there we go. It's all working. I am trying to um, put it in PowerPoint. If you, go to the, if you go to the the bottom right um next to the zoom the zoom in option at the bottom right you'll see um a little presenter thing keep going Oh, Jay Yazi says you can push the F5 button too. F5 button's not working. An F5, but it's not. So down at the bottom of um, the page, Tommy, 
um, where it says 59% and you can adjust, you should be able to hit that button there um, to, to the, the left. left, to the left of it. So bring your cursor down. I see your cursor, keep coming down, keep coming down, keep coming down. There's a little book there. And then to the right of that, there's a presenter uh, thing on the PowerPoint. I, it's not showing on my end. It's just like it's all all crunching together. Oh, it is. Yeah. Do you see little icons at the bottom that says notes, and then there's like four boxes, and then pages uh, that looks like an open book? Do you see any of those icons at the bottom of that screen? None. None. You can go do slideshow in the tabs as well. I mean, let me, let like, me reduce this. This is file, home, insert. Okay, I'll let design. Jen do it because I'm going to distract you all. So it's a slideshow. Can you see the tab at the top? It's by animations. You go up. Go to slideshow. There you and go. And then you can go to the left. It's just from the beginning. There you go. There you go. Great. Um, we are still doing the the break. We just wanted to make sure that the, the audio and the presentation were, were up. So um, I think okay. we still have a couple more minutes. All so. right. Yeah. Oh, um, so I just got confirmation. You can start now if you want to. Uh, we are good to go. OK, all right. Howdy, hi, um, got that Tansela, she told me on Chero, they object to order in a shot, they better get away, uh, other, um, Chora Chichina, and she out. I know she don't know, yeah, not that she's not that somebody seen to the genie that she don't look at that. No cat, nay, that's not. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Tommy Rock, and currently I am at. Princeton University. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. My, I'm out here with a research team from Princeton University. We've been having technical issues for the past couple of days. And as you can see, it's continuing what's with my laptop. So good thing there's like a, I have a backup. So so um, I will be talking about environmental exposure and I'll, towards the end of it, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing currently. And the slide that you see here is in Blue Gap Kutchi chapter. This is one of the abandoned uranium mine in Blue Gap Kutchi chapter. You can see some reclamation work that has been done. And there's some uranium ore down below as well. So I so this is like a uh, one of the places that I've been in in sample spring from there before. So um, the reason why I am, I'm doing what I'm doing now and is because of my grandparents. My, uh, my grandparents, both of them we see on top. My grandfather, he stressed education to me quite a bit. He was a former World War II vet and a former UN minor. He passed away of cancer back in 2006, and my grandmother passed away not too long ago, um, he, over the over a year ago. And the last place that my grandfather worked was uh, the place called Moonlight Mine that shows on the right hand side. That's that's um, that's the last place he worked. There was a piece of rock. Um, at the entrance, as uh, three of them were coming out of the mine shaft, my grandfather was walking in the middle. There's again another guy walking behind. The rock fell on the last person, killed him instantly. And from there, they told everybody to go home. So my grandfather took me there once. I didn't know why he took me there. He was still on the edge of the open pit mine for, it seems like an, over an hour or so. This is when I was a little kid. And later when I came back, 
when I got my, my bachelor degree from Arizona State, he told me the full story, what, what I just told you. So now I understood why he was there. And I think it was just there reminiscing as well. So the outline of my topic, it's like a little bit of the background, which you heard, um, Native American tribes, environmental justice, geology, the federal policies, um, pathway of exposure, a study part one, um, study part two, um, talk a little about what I'm doing as uh, now, abandoned uranium mines, oil, oil, gas, and fracking, and water contamination, soil as well. So that's the outline of my presentation. So for Native American tribes, um, a lot of that start with manifest destiny, a lot of tribes were forced um, out of their homelands and, and um, later move into um, reservations. Um, then there's a Dalsack where a lot of the tribal lands have been sold off and we're still seeing some of the stuff that has happened in the past and some of the stuff that's related to the, the to our treaties as well for the tribes that have treaties. And then in the early 1934s, like uh, there was the Indian Reorganization Act where um, the tribal government was established by the federal government. And a lot of it, from, from a lot of stuff that I've done and a lot of stuff that I read related to natural resource extraction, a lot of that has to do with like um, trying to have, trying to get them, getting the permission from the tribe to extract minerals, minerals from indigenous, indigenous, <laughs> indigenous land. And you can still see it's still happening today. And it's an ongoing, ongoing thing. Um, for for those of you that don't know, there's 574 federally recognized tribes, 63 state recognized tribes. There's a, a difference between um, the federally recognized and state recognized. And in the end, the plenary power is retained by US Congress. They can end a tribe's um, federal recognition as you have seen or heard um, in the past administration on the Trump administration that happened to, to a tribe or a couple of tribes. So it is, um, it, it, it does happen. So I know there's some tribes that are trying to regain that um, federal, federal recognition as well. Oh, there you go. For, for Navajo Nation, um, when you're working, uh, when you're doing research, there's multiple layers, of multiple steps in working with tribes, and each tribes are different. For Navajo Nation, there's the, there's like layers, and there's five agencies. There's 110 chapters. In the past um, census, now census, there was like um, close to 400,000 tribal members. It's like 399, 494. Um, total populations, and almost half of them live on the Navajo Nation. So to do this um, research, it's like getting community support, uh, getting a chapter resolution, and in some cases you'll get agency support, and also getting the tribal departments involved as well. In, in my case, um, Navajo EPA, getting the, getting them involved. And if we're doing health research, then it's like environmental health research, then you get the health board involved as well. And in some cases, the Nova Nation Human Research Group will ask for a, um, a support, supporting letter from the Nat Healthy Association, the Nat Healthy Association as well. Um, I do work with them quite a bit and and help interpret some of the scientific um, information to Navajo. And when I go to their meetings, I usually learn a lot from them as well. So they have, they know a lot and they know ways to, to put that in Western perspective, which is, which is great. And in terms of, mining 
um, and indigenous populations. Um, you can see on the map on the left hand side where the tribal reservation are in the west, and the dark areas are where the mining mining activities are taking place. So a lot of them are near tribal reservations. So there's there's a lot that's going on or near tribal reservation. And for for a lot of stuff that I do, um, there's about 15,000 abandoned uranium mines in, in the West. And there's a um, report that was done by um, was a abandoned mines, um, a federal agency that, that, that documented that as well. There's about 15,000 abandoned uranium mine. And there is a US EPA report that document that as well. So in this um, slide, it shows, it, it, you can really see that. So it's not just Navajos are being impacted by, by um, abandoned uranium mines or mining activities. Like if you look at the, the full picture of nuclear or nuclear, nuclear cycle, um, from where the mining takes place, where it's being taken, there's a nuclear power plant in the waste. It's like um, a lot of that seems to impact um, tribal tribal lands as well as like um, where the mining took place, and then the federal agency talking about where to dispose of these nuclear waste as well. And the uh, Paiute and Shoni um, in Nevada, they they were fighting that, and I don't know if they're still fighting that, but I know that's one of their biggest concerns as well and the stuff that they um that that they experienced as well like the nuclear testing that happened and also um, some of the stuff that happened in New Mexico as well the white sands um the white sands testing it's pretty I find it pretty ironic that I'm at Princeton University where Albert Einstein split the atoms and and then there was the atomic, atomic bomb that, that that came from that. It went from Princeton, then the some of the research that took place over at University of Chicago and making its way towards West. And for the health impact um, for Native Americans, like suicide tends to be the, the highest for, for Native American. And life, life expectancies um, tend to be quite, quite low, low. And also with, um, with abandoned uranium mine, it's like um, residential that live close to um, abandoned mines tend to have um, health, health effects due to that um, close proximity of, of abandoned uranium mines. And Dr. Johnny Lewis from University of New Mexico. They're doing some research on, on the health impact side and that um, study is still ongoing. And for some of the stuff that I've seen in terms of uranium, I do see two types of uranium ore out. Um, they are cornitite and uraninite. And some of the, at the beginning of, of mining or uranium mining, there was vanadium mining. And a lot of the um, vanadium mining took place like in the early, um, like 1918s in the Four Corners, like um, King Valley, um, Red Valley, um, Cove. Um, so some of these minings actually are over a century years old. Um, I know for Monument 2 in King Valley, that seems to be the case. It made a transition from vanadium mining onto uranium mining. So with, with these um, ores, though, you hear a lot about uranium mining, but people that don't know, it's like um, there's a lot more to it than just uranium mining. There's uranium mine, uh, there's uranium ore, there's vanadium ore, and there's um, thorium. And, and that ore as well. So they're all clumped together. So 
so yeah there's there's a lot more more to it than that and in terms of the radiation side there's alpha beta and gamma radiation as well and gamma radiation goes through things and beta radiation can grow through some some things and then there's alpha radiation which don't go through through anything and it travels about maybe an, an inch or so but out of all three of those radiations that come alpha tend to do a lot more damage once it gets inside your body and it can get inside your body by dust or water drinking water and water contamination drinking that or if you um, eat something that's elevating uranium and um so so there's a um, couple of ways of, of that happening and for the geology part particularly looking at mining the valley um where you see the uranium ore is the Shurnup Mongkopi formation, it's like an, an upper Triassic formation, it's like an, right to, it's on top of the Shelly sandstone, it's like an upper Shelly sandstone. And where those are uranium ore um, long, long time ago, late Triassic, there was, the water was actually going from Texas going north, northwest actually. So there was a big river that was going towards the northwest and and these tributaries water or waters or streams or what have you they were they were draining into this river and where these water were that's where you see the uranium ore so so you see um, um these uranium ore where there were past um streams stream beds And to the left hand side bottom, that skyline. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. And for Navajo Nation, there are four um, former uranium mill sites or superfine sites. There's um, Hachita, Tuba City, Shiprock, and Church Rock. And Church Rock is where the spill that happened back in 1979 that released a million gallons of, of radioactive waste downstream. And it's policy related to, to um, uranium mining activities or uranium military radiation, radiation control act, which is specifically for former uranium mills. There's about 24 um, former uranium mills and all of these former uranium mills are under the Department of Energy and there are Superfund sites. And the Department of Energy is overseeing a lot of these um, former uranium mills. Well, there's the Department of Energy and Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission and US EPA that are all involved. And there's the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, or otherwise known as the Superfund Act. For another nation, due to our lack of population density, this law has been modified to fit the needs of, of another nation. So um, they target a lot of community centers where they see some, some populations and they target those areas and look at um, mines near the location and focus on those mines. And in, in a couple of slides, you'll see that um, they came up with a chart that, um, that goes up to like 10, 10, 10 times the background level. So normally it's like a, the background level is like um, 30, 30 parts per million or, or lower. Anything above that would be like um, above the background level. But there are areas that have natural high, high background levels, which is like a whole, whole different discussion as well. And for Skyline, it's like, um, it, it really started from, from there and started from this documentary called The Return of Navajo Boy. There's a lady by the name of Judy Pasternak did a, a, um, a series of articles for LA Times. And at the, at the time, there's a, a pretty strong congressman by the name of Henry Waxman. He read the stories in LA Times, got the federal agency together, told them to clean up the, 
the past mining activity on the nation. And it came about a, a five-year plan. There's, I believe there's three five-year plans starting from 2007. There's two five-year plans actually, and then there's one eight-year plan, I believe. And then um, now there's a 10-year plan. No, it's three five-year plans and, and an eight-year plan. And, and starting from 2007 to, to the current date, um, I know of just one, one um, abandoned mine that's been cleaned up, that skyline. And skyline had a lot of um, uh, media exposure. And the return of Nama Boy really, really helped in the cause of, of um, cleaning up that, that site. So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in my presentations, looking at pathway exposure and some of the stuff that I've done has to do with like I'm soil and water and I'm getting to air right now. I'm currently doing research at Skyline looking at dust and I do have a dust collector out at Skyline, which I'm, I'm going to pick up um, when I travel back east um, next month and some of the stuff that um, I've been involved at Northern Arizona University. I have to look at our traditional, our traditional indigenous food. We did a research over in Cameron looking at five sheep that were near the uh, um, abandoned uranium mines in Cameron and five on the reservation that, that had no abandoned uranium mine and five that were off the reservation. So, so the one that were near the abandoned uranium mine. There are some tissues that were elevated, and and that research is um, still ongoing. And the idea is to find to find out what those Mexican contaminant levels are. So um, there'll be a lot more information related to that, and, and so, sort of like um, what you see in fish. Fish and mercury is like um, how much you can eat, it's like um, what is cons will be considered safe and, and all. So that, that research is still ongoing. I know they're doing some research um, out in Red Valley Cove area. Um, the Net College is involved. University of New Mexico is involved and Northern, Northern Arizona University is involved as well. So there's, in terms of Navajo or indigenous populations like um, looking at pathway exposure for, for us is like um, there's a lot more that needs to be looked at to, to be to fully understand um, our the exposure site to, to the to the general public. It's like um, so there's a lot more work to, that needs to be done, a lot more research that needs to be done to fully understand so we can better make um, decision making. But a lot of that has to do, I mean, we have to work with our uh, tradis traditional knowledge holders and find an effective, culturally appropriate way of, of coming with policies related to that as well. And this is like a, a case study that I did. Um, this was a grass grassroots organization that um, by Tulani Lake Enterprise from Tulani Lake. We got a grant from US EPA, the Environmental Justice Grant, and Jock Saron, um, Chris Shuey, um, Jenny Nyazi were all involved in this um, project. And this map shows you different pathway exposures that like, come um, from either from abandoned rainy mines. Um, water contamination or people using materials from these abandoned mines or mills and building homes, um, putting down foundations or building corrals, horse corrals, sheep corrals, or shade house. So, so this map that I made um, back in 20, 20, 2010, it, show, it shows that. So, so the darker the, the map is, there's, um, more more pathway exposure be, being being done, and the red um, square and and oval shaped areas are where 
I'm currently doing research as well, so like stuff related to oil and gas and Anatheria um, over in Chaco Canyon, just south of here and out in Sanders area as well. And for Sanders area, it's like, um, there's no mining activity in the area, but because of church rock, um, of the spill that happened something that with the mining activity that, that was going on for over 20 years and over in church rock, the water table is high and the uranium ore is beneath the water table. So a lot of the water had to be pumped out. And so the water was running year round like in the Purple River. And I went through the community of Sanders, went through the Pukuruva Valley. So when we did this study, we found out that the Pukuruva Valley, um, we found that some of the um, wells were contaminated specifically in the Pukuruva River. Um, this map shows you um, where we got water samples from. The, these little brown dots to south of the Pukuruva River um, shows you that the, the water weren't contaminated, but all the water contaminants tend to be along the Perker, Perker River. It's like um, that red line there is the Perker River. This is a tributary to the Little Colorado River, and the Colorado River goes into the, into the um, Colorado River. And when we did this project, this, um, this site was done by Chris Shui. And there was um, a study done back in 86 and 88 by USGS and a former graduate student, Dixon. Dixon, I believe, is at University of New Mexico, I think, now, teaching a um, professor now, I believe. But in 2015, that's where we got the sample. Anytime um, that I'm doing work around water contamination, I always like to sample twice. The first one to see what the levels are. The second, the second sample is like for confirmation purposes. So both samples, the first and second one, confirmed the, the water contamination. But the, this data from Arizona Department of Environmental Quality shows that there was water contamination all the way from, from 2003. And at 2015, when we did the project, you can see these um, water contamination all up to 2015. So this would be con considered chronic exposure. This is a, the public water, the former water system for Sanders, Arizona. And this is the community of Sanders. Sanders is actually off the reservation. So this falls under, under the jurisdiction of Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. But now it's like it fell under Nova Nation EPA um, for the work that we've done. And those are the two areas. The school is the upper rectangular and the bottom is um, Sanders. And the public water system well hit is this little sheet house is closed by board wire. And yeah, that's just, that was it. <laughs> and this is a public notice by Arizona Department of Health. And it just says basically that um, the water is the water is safe to drink. Keep drinking it. Just um, there, there's nothing wrong with it. But um, but yeah, there's a person. There are two people that came up from Arizona, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, did a presentation about this, and the community of Sanders made them cry, and they went back and. Um, the community of Sanders um, established a homeowner association. The Sanders um, Elementary Middle School um, start, um, started um, buying a bottle of water. Um, the community of Sanders as well, and um, and the water the 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 water came from another nation. Um, so the water that came from the nation is good that provided water for for Sanders. I remember one of the meetings that that I went to, it's like um, the representative from Intuit told the community that there wasn't enough water water pressure to provide water for for Sanders and the school. So the 
the community members had to choose where the water goes. So either the water stays in Sanders or the water goes to the school. So I remember I remember that there was a lot of people that broke down crying. And I always think about that when it comes to water issues. So that's and um, right now it's like I'm doing some work over in Bears Ears, and there are quite a bit of abandoned uranium really mines, but native mine as well. There, there, there are um, this abandoned mine, and out of all the abandoned uranium really mine, this area tends to be the the hottest area. Um, the gamma radiation were, were off the charts. Um, I got a soil sample from there that range that went up to like 6,000 picocuries per liter. And I get a I got an XRF from Princeton University and got a sample from there as well. Same thing. It was like over 6,000 parts per million. So so um, I seen traces of people camping there and I seen um, traces of little kids on top of there. So, so I, I see some of the things that's happening in Bears is problematic because there's no warning sign. There's no nothing, nothing that mentions about these um, abandoned uranium mines, what the public are being exposed to, and some of the risks that are associated with that as well. So it's it's concerning. It's really, it really is. And this slide shows um, a map that I made. So it's some of the uranium levels. Um, the hot, hottest area is like, a, is, a, is like dark red, maroon, maroon color. This is like the same area where my friend was standing, the area that I was, that I was talking about was like um, the highest. On the left hand side, the white dots are the background levels um, away from that particular site. So as you see, as you get closer, it goes up. This site here is like um, 7.3 and that site is like 20.6. They're below background level. Both of, both of them, even though um, this is a little higher, but still background level. And this shows you that um, it is it is pretty high. And on the right-hand side is um, an XRF. And again, it's like um, that air is also pretty high. And this is, um, out in Fry Canyon, there's an area, um, there's a place called Heavy Jack Mine. And there's a sign right in this area that encourages recreational vehicle to be used. And I sample the washes and I'm, and I was really surprised that I seen rating levels like I'm pretty high. And that's, um, problematic for me is like when I, from what I've seen doing uranium research and exposure and what I see here, it's like um, dust can go deeper into the lungs and there's kids out there playing in these um, dust and there's um, the public out there playing, playing in the dust as well. So it's like uh, um, there needs to be a lot more um, education that needs to be done and um, some research that needs to be done in this area. So the public and the visitors that come to Bear Theaters are well informed of what's out there as well. And it's making this transition to a regulated water and unregulated water. It's like um, the regulated water is a public water and the bottom is unregulated water sources, like windmill springs or, or what have you which goes into the Safe Drinking Water Act. From what I've seen, the Safe Drinking, the Safe Drinking Water Act is, is really um, geared towards population density. 
anyone that lives in like inexpensive housings or towns, they have they have access to public water. That anyone that lives further away from that, that live on the boonies, with their sheep and livestock, like um, a lot of them don't have public water, and these people um, that live in isolated rural areas have to go to like a, a regular water point to get water and bring bring them back. So. So for, um, for some of the um, natives, there's like um, nearly 14% of native household like access to, to public water system compared to that to um, the US populations at 0.6% of the US. But for our tribes, in some cases, like 30% of the population and, and depending on where you are, it can, it can go up to like 40%. So, um, so, so during the pandemic, um, the Department of Water Resource and tribal government started putting out these regulated, regulated water points uh, where you can put, um, fill up like five gallon tank and, and get like some um, tablets and put them in. But during the summer months, the five gallon goes really fast. So I think there's, there's other ways that can be, that can be, um, then to, to address the, the lack of potable water on that one nation. And again, the same thing, regulated water import and regulated water sources. And some of the stuff that I was working on is I'm putting these tanks um, inside Manama Valley Tribal Park. The water is coming from sandstones and I look at the heavy metal in the water and the, they both look pretty good below the MCL for Safe Drinking Water Act, except for Sand Spring, which I do see exceedances. And I talked to Dr. Kaleta Chief about um, using this as one of her test sites for um, nano water filtration system. So um, I still need to talk to her about this some more and hopefully she picked this site because that water is producing and for the people that live in Site Monument Valley, that will be great for them. They've been trying to ask for water for like over 20 years. There's people that have been really proactive, even going all the way to Windy Rock, tried to persuade the tribal government to, um, to, to provide water for the community, like for the community in, inside the Mining Valley Tribal Park. So with the grassroots organization like Tawani Lake, Six World Solution, um, inclusive community consultants, like I'm, I was able to get some funding from them and um, get these um, tanks and pipes in and um, put the local community inside the tribal park working. So they were able to, to, to do this. We were able to do this together and started educating, it's, <laughs> start educating them about um, water quality as well and some stuff related to Safe Drinking Water Act as well. So moving forward, um, we're in the Southwest and we do have a severe drought. And I think there needs to be ways that grassroots organization can get involved. I know there's there's some that are currently doing stuff like Dig Deep, Atlantic Enterprise, um, University of Arizona is doing some stuff related to providing safer water, potable water for the communities as well. And some of the stuff that Six World Solution has done is like um, creating these um, rainwater catchment systems so uh, people have access to, to water. I think they're just mostly using this for irrigation and livestock purposes. And some of the stuff that I worked on with Tawana Lake is um, drilling um, wells along the Little Colorado River where we were able to hit um, good water for the community around Black Falls, and uh, they 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 have good water now. Um, this project is still ongoing. I'm working with um, some a company down in in Phoenix, um, some water filtration company that can um, put in some some water filtration system as well, just for um, 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 precautionary um, purposes. When it rains, when it's really flooding, I, we do see um, so uh, turbidity go up, so it gets really um, red. 
and some of the stuff that I'm working on right now, oil and gas, um, and and um, I was out in Aneth area past couple of days. Our technology went down. Um, we we do have some data, but we will be back in Aneth area to collect some more data. Um, some of our technology is working now and has been replaced as well. So we we'll back out there and get some more data. Right now we're in Chaco Canyon, helping the community of, of Counselor address their um, exposure to oil and gas as well. And, and um, prior to coming here, I was out there um, with, the, with the research team and um, I have to leave a little early from there to get here and get things ready as well. But my technology failed me again. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so this this work is ongoing so hopefully by either may or june i'll have some data and go back to to anna chapter and Montezuma creek or uh, this chapter and counselor and do my report and tell them what i what we found and a lot of stuff that i that i'm doing is like traditional economic Traditional ecological knowledge has to do with like novel fundamental law, natural, traditional, customary, common law, working with the Natal Association <clears throat> and helping me um, translate that to um, into Navajo. So, so um, something more um, culturally appropriate that, that we can use from um, the Western Western science perspective. And in conclusion, the Western model of risk assessment, there's a risk assessment, risk communication, management as well. It's all Western, Western way of, of approaching things. Then there's the two indigenous way, which is a holistic approach. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called um, holistic risk assessment. There's a researcher by the name of Mary, Kit and her colleague published a paper back in 2002 called Holistic Risk Assessment or Holistic Risk Environmental Decision Making and Native Perspective. And that's where I got this holistic risk assessment. And it's basically where um, you incorporate everything within the environment, like water soil the dirt the air and all the um all the biota all the animals that live in in that particular space and how they're being impacted and including man itself or humanness and how we're being impacted so that that'll be like um all this risk assessment from from uh from indigenous point of view before i started my PhD program really got into um, research. There's, I talked to a um, traditional knowledge holder that told me to, to do this and to use that approach when I do um, research. And, and I still do to this day, and I still go back and they still school me on a lot of that stuff. And my acknowledgements, findings, and questions. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, we do have a couple of questions and I can I can read those to you here. Um, the first question is, is it possible to seek funds from the new infrastructure bill to improve safe water availability on the Navajo Nation? Yeah, um, there are a couple of grassroots organizations that are seeking funds from that. And hopefully we see um, some of that trickled down, like maybe maybe this summer. So waiting and see. But um, when that happened back in 2021, um, some of that money came through, and so, um, Tolano Lake Enterprise was lucky enough to get some of that funding, so we we're able to do some project you know, using that. So yeah grassroots organizations are able to do that. Of course. Um, OK, the next question says, um, well, thank you for your the presentation. Have you worked with the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act or Downwinders Fund? 
I have several family members, including my father, passed from cancer after exposure in the Fort Defiance area between the years of 1951 to 1958. That I, I, I have not. Um, I haven't um, tried to pursue that yet. So um, I can talk to um, Nova EPA, the super funds, and, and ask. And um, since I'm in Farmington, the RICA office, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act office is over in Shiprock. I can go and ask them, ask them question. Maybe they'll give me an answer. And if it is, then it's like, um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, next question is, uh, what do you feel would be the best solution if funding was not an issue to provide drinking water to the Monument Valley, Valley area community members? Wait, say it again. Uh, what do you feel would be the best solution to provide drinking water to the Mount Monument Valley area community members? The best solution will be um, Monument Valley is very, very unique because some of the water tables, some of the aquifers are actually pretty, pretty close. And there is there are, there is a lot of water in Monument Valley. So I think finding locations will be key first. And to drill some of those wells. And um, I think by doing that, we will be able to provide water. Um, I know for I know for um, inside the tribal park, like um, way further in the back, I do believe there's water back there as well. And just getting access to like a drill rig and and, and um, drilling that and getting getting water, I think that will help um, address a lot of the need for water for the people that live like. Um, towards the back of Mining Valley Travel Park. And then for um, for Douglas Mesa area as well, there are some springs that are, are, that are safe. And I think it just needs to be um, addressed like a putting bigger tanks there to help the need um, for, for the Douglas Mesa area as well. So yeah, there, there are ways that, that can be um, there's something that can be done that, that can address the need for water, basically. I know it was like, um, um, if the Tolana Lake Enterprise get the funding that requested from Navajo Nation, I'll be able to work with them again and address a lot of that as well. I know they do have a hydrology hydrologist that they work with as well. So I'm looking forward to working with them again, which I hope they do get funded and um, I do pressure Tulani Lake, uh, Tulani Lake Enterprise to come out to Monument, Monument Valley area as well to address the need for, for water as well, and um, and then other area as well. Okay, Dr. Rock, thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, for providing questions. Um, and at this time, I will go ahead and turn it back over to Rachel to uh, close up today's session. Thank you, Jen. Um, okay. So on behalf of the NASIS program at Utah State University, we'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Supernot, Dr. Fowler, and Dr. Rock for sharing their information, their knowledge with us today. It was such an amazing presentation, each of these. Um, and such good work that they are doing. And what kind of Zoom symposium would it be if there wasn't a dash of technical difficulties? So we are great, very grateful for our presenters today. And if folks have additional questions or would like to learn more about the MESAS program, you can visit www.usu.edu forward slash MESAS, and that's in the chat. And on behalf of all of us, thank you, Ahehet, 
so much for attending and have a great rest of your day. Hagoanet. Hagoanet.